Chapter twenty seven of El Dorado by Baroness Orzee. Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Savage in September two thousand and seven. Chapter twenty seven. In the Conciergerie. Marguerite, accompanied by Sir Andrew Folks, walked rapidly along the quay. It lacked ten minutes to the half hour. The night was dark and bitterly cold. Snow was still falling in sparse thin flakes, and lay like a crisp and glittering mantle over the parapets of the bridges and the grim towers of the Chatelet prison. They walked on silently now. All that they had wanted to say to one another had been said inside the squalid room of their lodgings, when Sir Andrew folks had come home and learned that Chauvelin had been. "'They are killing him by inches, Sir Andrew!' had been the heart-rending cry which burst from Marguerite's oppressed heart, as soon as her hands rested in the kindly ones of her best friend. "'Is there aught that we can do?' There was, of course, very little that could be done. One or two fine steel files which Sir Andrew gave her to conceal beneath the folds of her kerchief, also a tiny dagger with sharp poisoned blade, which for a moment she held in her hand hesitating, her eyes filling with tears, her heart throbbing with unspeakable sorrow. Then slowly, very slowly, she raised the small, death-dealing instrument to her lips, and reverently kissed the narrow blade. "'If it must be,' she murmured, "'God in his mercy will forgive.' She sheathed the dagger, and this, too, she hid in the folds of her gown. "'Can you think of anything else, Sir Andrew, that he might want?' she asked. "'I have money in plenty, in case those soldiers—' Sir Andrew sighed, and turned away from her so as to hide the hopelessness that she felt. Since three days now he had been exhausting every conceivable means of getting at the prison guard with bribery and corruption. But Chauvelin and his friends had taken excellent precautions. The prison of the Conciergerie, situated as it was in the very heart of the labyrinthine and complicated structure of the Châtelet and the House of Justice, and isolated from every other group of cells in the building, was inaccessible, save from one narrow doorway which gave on the guard-room first, and thence on the inner cell beyond. Just as all attempts to rescue the late unfortunate Queen from that prison had failed, so now every attempt to reach the imprisoned Scarlet Pimpernel was equally doomed to bitter disappointment. The guard-room was filled with soldiers day and night. The windows of the inner cell, heavily barred, were too small to admit of the passage of a human body and they were raised twenty feet from the corridor below. Sir Andrew had stood in the corridor two days ago. He had looked on the window behind which he knew that his friend must be eating out his noble heart in a longing for liberty, and he had realised then that every effort at help from the outside was foredoomed to failure. "'Courage, Lady Blakeney,' he said to Marguerite, when anon they had crossed the Pont au Change, and were wending their way slowly along the Rue de la Barrierie. "'Remember our proud dictum. The Scarlet Pimpernel never fails. And also this, that whatever messages Blakeney gives you for us, whatever he wishes us to do, we are to a man ready to do it, and to give our lives for our chief. Courage! Something tells me that a man like Percy is not going to die at the hands of such vermin as Chauvelin and his friends." They had reached the great iron gates of the House of Justice. Marguerite, trying to smile, extended her trembling hand to this faithful, loyal comrade. "'I'll not be far,' he said. When you come out, do not look to the right or left, but make straight for home. I'll not lose sight of you for a moment, and as soon as possible will overtake you. God bless you both." He pressed his lips on her cold little hand, and watched her tall, elegant figure as she passed through the great gates, until the veil of falling snow hid her from his gaze. Then with a deep sigh of bitter anguish and sorrow, he turned away, and was soon lost in the gloom. Marguerite found the gate at the bottom of the monumental stairs open when she arrived. Chauvelin was standing immediately inside the building, waiting for her. "'We are prepared for your visit, Lady Blakeney,' he said, "'and the prisoner knows that you are coming.' He led the way down one of the numerous and interminable corridors of the building, and she followed briskly, pressing her hand against her bosom there where the folds of her kerchief hid the steel files and the precious dagger. Even in the gloom of these ill-lighted passages she realised that she was surrounded by guards. There were soldiers everywhere. Two had stood behind the door when first she entered, and had immediately closed it with a loud clang behind her. And all the way down the corridors, through the half-light engendered by feebly flickering lamps, she caught glimpses of the white facings on the uniforms of the town guard, or occasionally the glint of steel of a bayonet. Presently Chauvelin paused beside a door which he had just reached. His hand was on the latch, for it did not appear to be locked, and he turned toward Marguerite. "'I am very sorry, Lady Blakeney,' he said, in simple, deferential tones, 
that the prison authorities, who at my request are granting you this interview at such an unusual hour, have made a slight condition to your visit. A condition? she asked. What is it? You must forgive me, he said, as if purposely evading her question, for I give you my word that I had nothing to do with a regulation that you might justly feel was derogatory to your dignity. If you will kindly step in here, a wardress in charge will explain to you what is required. He pushed open the door, and stood aside ceremoniously in order to allow her to pass in. She looked on him with deep puzzlement, and a look of dark suspicion in her eyes. But her mind was too much engrossed with the thought of her meeting with Percy to worry over any trifle that might, as her enemy had inferred, offend her womanly dignity. She walked into the room, past Chauvelin, who whispered as she went by, "'I will wait for you here, and, I pray you, if you have aught to complain of, summon me at once.' Then he closed the door behind her. The room in which Marguerite now found herself was a small, unventilated quadrangle, dimly lighted by a hanging lamp. A woman in a soiled cotton gown, and lank grey hair, brushed away from a parchment-like forehead, rose from the chair in which she had been sitting when Marguerite entered, and put away some knitting on which she had apparently been engaged. "'I was to tell you, citizeness,' she said the moment the door had been closed and she was alone with Marguerite, that the prison authorities have given orders that I should search you before you visit the prisoner." She repeated this phrase mechanically, like a child who has been taught to say a lesson by heart. She was a stoutish, middle-aged woman, with that pasty, flabby skin peculiar to those who live in want of fresh air. But her small, dark eyes were not unkindly, although they shifted restlessly from one object to another, as if she were trying to avoid looking the other woman straight in the face. "'That you should search me reiterated Marguerite slowly, trying to understand. "'Yes,' replied the woman. "'I was to tell you to take off your clothes, so that I might look them through and through. I have often had to do this before, when visitors have been allowed inside the prison, so it is no use your trying to deceive me in any way. I am very sharp at finding out if one has any papers or files or ropes concealed in an under-petticoat. "'Come,' she added more roughly, seeing that Marguerite had remained motionless in the middle of the room, "'the quicker you are about it, the sooner you will be taken to see the prisoner.' These words had their desired effect. The proud Lady Blakeney, inwardly revolting at the outrage, knew that resistance would be worse than useless. Chauvelin was the other side of the door. A call from the woman would bring him to her assistance, and Marguerite was only longing to hasten the moment when she could be with her husband. She took off her kerchief and her gown, and calmly submitted to the woman's rough hands as they wandered with sureness and accuracy to the various pockets and folds that might conceal prohibited articles. The woman did her work with peculiar stolidity. She did not utter a word when she found the tiny steel files and placed them on a table beside her. In equal silence she laid the little dagger beside them, and the purse which contained twenty gold pieces. These she counted in front of Marguerite, and then replaced them in the purse. Her face expressed neither surprise, nor greed, nor pity. She was obviously beyond the reach of bribery, just a machine, paid by the prison authorities to do this unpleasant work and no doubt terrorised into doing it conscientiously. When she had satisfied herself that Marguerite had nothing further concealed about her person, she allowed her to put her dress on once more. She even offered to help her on with it. When Marguerite was fully dressed, she opened the door for her. Chauvelin was standing in the passage, waiting patiently. At sight of Marguerite, whose pale, set face betrayed nothing of the indignation which she felt, he turned quick, inquiring eyes on the woman. Two files, a dagger, and a purse with twenty louis said the latter, curtly. Chauvelin made no comment. He received the information quite placidly, as if it had no special interest for him. Then he said quietly, "'This way, citizeness.' Marguerite followed him, and two minutes later he stood beside a heavy, nail-studded door that had a small square grating let into one of the panels, and said simply, "'This is it.' Two soldiers of the National Guard were on sentry at the door. Two more were pacing up and down outside it, and had halted when citizen Chauvelin gave his name and showed his tricolour scarf of office. From behind the small grating in the door, a pair of eyes peered at the newcomers. "'Qui va là?' came the quick challenge from the guard-room within. "'Citizen Chauvelin, of the Committee of Public Safety,' was the prompt reply. There was the sound of grounding of arms, of the drawing of bolts, and the turning of a key in a complicated lock. The prison was kept locked from within and very heavy bars had to be moved ere the ponderous door slowly swung open on its hinges. Two steps led up into the guard-room. Marguerite mounted them with the same feeling of awe and almost of reverence as she would have mounted the steps of a sacrificial altar. The guard-room itself was more brilliantly lighted than the corridor outside. 
the sudden glare of two or three lamps placed about the room caused her momentarily to close her eyes that were aching with many shed and unshed tears the air was rank and heavy with the fumes of tobacco of wine and stale food a large barred window gave on the corridor immediately above the door when marguerite felt strong enough to look around her she saw that the room was filled with soldiers some were sitting others standing others lay on rugs against the wall apparently asleep there was one who appeared to be in command for with a word he checked the noise that was going on in the room when she entered, and then he said curtly, "'This way, citizeness.' He turned to an opening in the wall on the left, the stone lintel of a door, from which the door itself had been removed. An iron bar ran across the opening, and this the sergeant now lifted, nodding to Marguerite to go within. Instinctively she looked round for Chauvelin, but he was nowhere to be seen. End of chapter 27